Mr. Monk, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Cooney and members of the commission. I'm Richard Monk, and uh, I'm with the Hollister and Brace. I'm the land use attorney for the Vetter Ranch and uh, co-author of the letter that Jonathan Leach just referred to. I'd like to address the findings, which uh, is uh, really where all of this either begins or ends, and we don't believe that you can make the required findings and remember that you must make all of the findings that are set forth by staff in the uh, uh, exhibits to the uh, staff report. Uh, finding 2.1.2 on your administrative findings that adverse environmental impacts are mitigated to the maximum extent feasible. Our comment letter of uh, February 17 demonstrates that the EIR is inadequate in its assessment of environmental impacts on air quality, noise, odors, fire hazard, night lighting, and traffic safety associated with the existing population. And the project, if, if approved, will exacerbate these environmental impacts, and these environmental impacts also constitute nuisances insofar as the better ranch is concerned. Finding 2.1.3, that streets and highways are adequate and properly designed to carry the type and quantity of traffic generated by the proposed use, um, piggybacking on what uh, Philip Vetter and Sarah Vetter and also Jonathan Leach have said, the uh, project <coughs> must be redesigned to provide a secondary emergency access road slash vehicle evacuation route that does not connect to Lillianston Canyon Road. Otherwise, the existing traffic challenges uh, in an emergency situation will be exacerbated by the project. The project's very significant increase in on-site population by 112 people. Commissioner Brown has already uh, cited the fact about the 97 exiting Kate vehicles and those will merge with the traffic coming downhill from the Vetter Ranch as well as all the other surrounding ranches plus the horse trailers, et cetera, which will try to be evacuating at the same time and will be backed up behind those 97 vehicles exiting Kate. Finding 2.1.5 that the project will not be detrimental to the health, safety, comfort, and convenience. This, of course, relates to the numerous unmitigated environmental impacts in terms of odor, nighttime lighting, traffic safety, environmental, uh, and traffic safety environmental impacts, and also, again, that these constitute nuisances. Therefore, there's no substantial evidence to support findings 2.1.2, 2.1.3, and 2.1.5. Again, all these findings need to be made. Uh, finding 2.1.9, that the proposed use is not inconsistent with the intent of the zone district. I'd like to discuss that in conjunction with finding 2.2, which is the required finding for a conditional use permit modification finding, and also in conjunction with finding 2.3.5 of the CDP findings. Uh, the conditional use permit finding says that uh, uh, an application for a major or minor CUP that includes a modification to the zone development standards, the decision maker shall first find that such modification is justified and consistent with the comprehensive plan and the intent of other applicable regulations and guidelines. I'd like to discuss all three of those together. The project involves you, an increase. You have about a minute to do that. Okay, anyway, it, the project uh, in, in, involves an increase in current structure floor area by approximately 50% increases in population by about 30% and will cause an increase of approximately 43% in number of vehicles to support an evacuation of the campus. We don't believe that these uh, issues merit the approval of this modification to the CUP and in fact calls for an entirely new CUP compliant with existing current county standards, not repeating this antiquated CUP that has been in existence for many years and then modifying it. Rather, what really should be done is the commission should require a entirely new CUP consistent and compliant with current county standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ma. Uh, I have one other speaker slip uh, for Mr. P. Kern of Gubernator Canyon. And if there's anyone else, um, please, uh, Get a, sleep, a speaker slip to uh, Commissioner Brown. I'm sorry, I assumed Mr. Kern. Ms. Kern. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patty Kern, and I do live on. 
I do live on Gobernador Canyon, and I don't like standing and talking in public, but I feel like Kate School likes to perform all their sports activities and, speci and special events in my yard, and I feel like half the time they're in my house, and I live across the canyon from them. So adding a PA system is traumatizing to me. Um, first thing I did really want to address, though, is that I don't know why I did not receive any notification of any of these meetings. I was not aware. I don't believe any of the people past where I live are aware of these meetings. I don't believe that any of the people on Shepherd's Mesa that the campus faces are aware. I think that's a very important point and most people, and we need to know. I learn when I read the, the local paper that it's already been approved. It's not okay. I think you need to get, make sure that these uh, meetings are advertised so people know about it. So that's just the first of it. One of the things, I've lived on Governor about 20 years, and uh, Kate School, I, I say they've done, they've done a beautiful job. It's a beautiful school, a fabulous presentation. It's exciting what they want to do, but I do believe that what they did build recently in the past 10 years are eyesores to Governor Canyon. They won green awards, but they took out all the trees and they never replaced them. If you walk along our gorgeous canyon and you look up, it looks like a bare, scarred track housing area. It's terrible. And now they're proposing to put 13 more of these homes in there. I would like to see trees put in and blocking and putting back what we had before, those beautiful tree-covered hills. I'd also like to see maybe trees covering all around all the fields so that it might help with the sound. Because I don't think any of these people who have checked the decibel rate have come over to Gobernador to find out that it must amplify. And the canyon, I can hear every kid talking to one another. It's unbelievable at times with the right wind. So please do something about our sound. Also, one last thing, the lights. I have noticed my beautiful stars at night disappearing. The more light that happens at that campus, the fewer stars I get. So I would love to see something done about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Is there anyone else that uh, is here from the public on this matter? I don't see anyone, so um, we'll go back to the applicant for any responsive comments. Mr. Mayor Connor. Good afternoon, Chair Cooney and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Steve Americano. I'm from the Brownstein Law Firm, and I've uh, been privileged to represent Kate in these proceedings and for a lot of other matters as well. Um, both of my kids went there, and uh, as I think some of you who have visited the campus know, it is a truly magnificent place, and a place that takes its, uh, its responsibilities very seriously. I'd like to address a few of the comments made during the public comment section and perhaps ask a couple of our consultants to come and join me. Uh, first, with respect to the wastewater treatment plant, you've heard a good deal about that. I would like, if we could, to put the slide up there that shows the distances. <coughs> there it is. Well, I can't quite read them either. Um, so in the upper right corner is Mr. and Mrs. Vetter's home. And we have measured the distances from their home to the wastewater treatment plant, which is that um, white uh, s structure just beyond the property line. And the distance, if I'm reading this correctly, is 924 feet. We've also measured the distance to the playing field in which the, um, oh, that was very kind, thank you. Um, where the, uh, the sports events take place and the, and the PA system is used and all that. And that is 1,123 feet. Excuse uh, me, uh, Mr. Americano, would you sure. use the pointer just to help yeah, us? Yeah, sure. Okay. There we go. Whoops, what'd I do? <laughs> Did I do that? This, we'll is why, this is why they don't let me near technology. Okay. 
No, no, I see. I, I did this by myself. Okay, so let, let me start again. This is the Vetter's house up here. This is the, water treat, the wastewater treatment plant here. And that distance we measured out at 923 feet. So that's about, what, three football fields. The distance to this playing field, which is just south of the wastewater treatment plant, is 1,123 feet. So we're going on four football fields. The distance from the Vetter's home to the art loft, and there were, there, there's uh, some comment in the letter that they sent to you last week about the, the lights from the art loft. That distance is 1,900 feet, so that's, what, six, six football fields. And then over to the 25-house dormitory, which is going to be demolished, which also apparently has been uh, visible to the veterans. That's 2,064 feet. So there are substantial distances involved here. And we, we actually went and we hired a, a, an odor consultant to measure the odors and the air quality around the wastewater treatment plant to see whether or not it is the source of the odors that the vetters are apparently uh, experiencing. And I would like uh, Kevin Hartigan, who is uh, our contractor on the project, to come up. Where are you, Kevin? There you are. Um, and talk a little bit about the result of that, of that uh, analysis. Chairman, commissioner, staff, I'd um, like to comment on what Steve had just presented here. And we had Criterion Environmental, who was in the EIR, come out and do a rather exhaustive study along the property line with scientific methods for testing for common wastewater odor sources, which would be the ammonias, the um, mercaptans, hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell that many of you experience at times in your fridges. <clears throat> and none of these testing results showed any measurable amounts based on EPA requirements or anything that was at a threshold of whether we could smell it at the property line, nor have we smelled those odors at the property line. Um, I'd also like to use this as, as a segue into bringing our wastewater treatment consultants, WERA, up to the microphone. And Lou, would you be coming up? I think it could provide a little bit more discussion on that in relative to the capacity of the plant and the reduction in odors as the throughput of the plant increases. Uh, <coughs> Chair and uh, board, uh, Lou Nagy, Water Resource Engineering. Um, we uh, worked along with the criterion on the uh, odor study. <coughs> And as Steve mentioned, there were no uh, anomalies in that study. There has been uh, some concern about the increase in, in uh, the throughput into, through the wastewater treatment plant and whether or not it will increase odors. And the, um, what what can be said about that is it's not a it's not definitely not a linear uh, relationship where if the throughput goes up 30 percent for instance uh, the odors go up 30 percent in in uh, the what does uh, what does have a lot to do with the odors is of course to have the plant running at its design capacity or as close to the design capacity as possible. Uh, quite often with school projects like this, and we've been involved in a few others, um, the varying of the flows uh, makes it very difficult to uh, keep the, al although it can be done, uh, it, to keep the plant operating smoothly, but as we as we increase flow here, we really believe that this plant will start to work. Um, well, basically, it will it will work better uh, due to the throughput. Can I ask you a follow-up sure. question? So, um, we heard from the vetters that the um, 
the odors are significant, at least at times, and and they would have reason to be good witnesses on that. Sure. Are you telling us that um, that's wrong? They haven't smelled odors, or are you saying no. that that the treatment well, plant will improve its operation with uh, with more? Uh, the likelihood. Of, oh, I'm sorry. The likelihood of odors will be less as the design capacity of the treatment plant is is uh, uh, approached I guess you could say so but unlike but in terms so of let me just ask my sure. question um, in terms of the various aspects of the uh, development you're suggesting that uh, the more uh, students occup occupants of uh, Kate school on a regular basis the fewer odors are going to be experienced from the sewer treatment plant. Well, what I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't say anything about the odors. Is is it's it's curious. The odor thing is curious, um, but the likelihood of the odors is probably less because you're getting close to the design capacity of the of the of the uh, of the plant. Um, in terms of the odors that the vetters are smelling, obviously they're smelling something. Um, and the when Criterion did the test, and it was during an operational period of of the plant, uh, there were no uh, there were no thre thresholds that were uh, uh, reached, and all of that data, I believe, is in the EIR. Um, <clears throat> one thing to consider, and I know that um, sometimes it's it's hard to realize, but but. Um, Older septic systems sometimes can can uh, fail, or um, they can be uh, sources of odors. So I would, uh, I if if someone were to ask me to try to find out what the vetters are smelling, I might say, let's go look at the the septic systems in the neighborhood. Okay, uh, Commissioner Blau. Well, well, <laughs> my question would be, it, it <clears throat> in investigating the complaint about the odors, did anybody look at how the the uh, treatment plant was being operated? It seemed to me, is there any concern about it not being operated properly, and that's the reason that it may have caused odors occasionally? I mean, I'm, I'm, having well, a tough I'm having a tough time believing that that more sewage being treated is going to lessen the odors. Well, my 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 best guess is that if there's is a problem with yeah. the odors, it's a result of the plant not being operated correctly. I think during certain periods of time. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I just asked the question. The 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 proper operation of the of the plant is is uh, tantamount in keeping odors down. No question. Um, we actually have somebody who can address that question directly, if I may. Yes, <coughs> Barney Codell. I'm Barney Caudill with Water Resource Engineering, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. The part of what Lou was just discussing in the increase in flow is there's a relationship of flow and the plant capacity. This plant was designed for this build out. It was not designed for the 2009 population. It was designed to handle their expansion. So there's a, a what we call hydraulic retention time through the plant. Currently, and since it's been commissioned, uh, that hydraulic retention time has actually been rather low. And so we're holding water in the plant um, to keep a balance between, the, um, understand that the, the plant itself is a living sort of, uh, it's a biological process. And so we have to keep the plant fed and keep it alive, keep it healthy. Um, Kate and others acknowledged that uh, in the beginning of the plant's life, it did go through some uh, rough times and it was trying to seed itself, become a healthy living plant. And uh, there's no dispute over that. Uh, it's been acknowledged multiple times. Um, however, uh, again, the surface area, the physical plant is not going to change with the addition of one or a hundred or however many people come into the plant. So whether it's uh, an event where they have parents and other people come onto the campus, 
the plant has features that balance the overall operation of the system. And so uh, where we talk about averages and peaks, we're able to uh, take a peak flow and uh, hold some of it in a equalization basin and then distribute that flow through the tank at its normal uh, and average operation. And again, the increase, what's gonna happen is the increase in population is gonna push this plant and the hydraulic retention time, which is very important because now we're pushing these flows through the plant at uh, a higher rate, which is gonna keep it from sitting there for a longer duration. Will you describe who operates the plant? Uh, VRSD, Ventura Regional Sanitation District. They are a so uh, de I guess de facto public agency, you might know them. Uh, they do <laughs> operate the plant. Um, they have, uh, I believe, grade three and four operators that oversee the plant. And then uh, daily they have, I believe, a grade three operator uh, to manage and uh, maintain the plant. Um, uh, as far as odor goes, I've been there. Some of you, it sounds like, have been there. Um, standing on top, literally directly on top of the plant, certainly there's odor. Um, uh, you know, moving around the plant, uh, it's, you know, I've been there multiple times and I don't uh, personally have a problem with that. I can't speak to the perception of other people. Uh, I can speak from my own experience. And uh, again, if those of you who have been there may or may not have notice so again um, following up on what Lou is saying is that the increase is actually going to push the plant into its potential all right thank you thank you for the clarification just a couple of other comments if Go I may ahead. thank you um, on the question of uh, traffic can we can we put up the slide with the intersection please oh there right I suppose if I learned how to use that, I could do that myself. Yeah, and the one back behind it. There you go. That's it. So this is the intersection of Cape, of the Cape Access Road and Gubernador Canyon, right here. Right? What I say, Gubernador, Lillingston. Right. Thank you. And this issue of traffic safety. Uh, is something that we've been talking to the vetters about for for a while and the school is as interested in avoiding collisions at this intersection as the vetters are and so one of the things that the school has done was to put in a guardhouse right here which checks people coming in and checks people going out. So in order to leave the campus, you have to come to a full stop right here at the guardhouse. And then there is a stop sign, a full stop stop sign right here that has been put in. And now we've put in a new sign a little ways back from the stop sign saying stop sign ahead so that people see that they're supposed to stop. And we're also constantly reminding our students and our faculty and others and visitors that they need to stop at that, at that intersection. So the school is aware of the issue, uh, and they're trying very hard in a number of different ways to, to address the issue. When it comes to fire safety and traffic, I think there's a real fundamental misunderstanding. The fire chief this morning cleared some of that up. The Kate fire response plan includes not just evacuation and maybe even not primarily evacuation because of all the open space with the ball fields and the other fields the first response may well be to shelter in place on the campus and not to evacuate at all and so the idea that we're going to have 97 vehicles traveling down Kate Road is we believe simply misplaced because that isn't the way that the uh, fire or other catastrophe is going to be necessarily dealt with. The call will be made at the time, but the school has facilities now and space to avoid evacuation. Evacuation is, is a, a problematic strategy for dealing with, with these kinds of, of catastrophes, and the school fortunately has the facilities on the campus to protect the campus population. Uh, it was mentioned that there is a subsurface 400,000 gallon tank that's been installed up there 
specifically for use by public fire agencies and others in fighting fires. There's also a designated helicopter landing pad so that the fire service can use the Kate campus as a staging area for fighting fires in the back country. The relationship that you heard about from the fire chief between the fire department and Kate School has been decades in the making and it's very strong and very powerful. And as you can appreciate, Kate has the most powerful interest in ensuring that its population is safe and protected at all times. They have as strong an interest as anybody in this room or anybody outside of this room in being sure that that happens. I um, want to talk a little bit about the EIR because I think that there are some misunderstandings about that EIR. We've been in the EIR process for three years. The first thing that was done was an initial study, and the initial study found that the project that you're seeing today, same project from three years ago, would have no significant environmental effects. None. And we looked at that and we said, well, that means we don't have to do an EIR because we don't have any environmental effects that have to be examined. And there was some exchange of correspondence and some letters sent and some hearings held. And the suggestion was made that we should do an EIR. And after thinking about it a while, we did. We agreed. We said, all right, we'll, we'll go the extra mile and we'll do an EIR. And we're now three years later and the EIR has been released. And the EIR reached exactly the same conclusion that the initial study reached three years ago. And that is that it, this project has no class one significant environmental effects. That is, number one, unusual. For those, you, if you've been on the commission for a while, you know that when an EIR comes before you with no class one impact, that is rare. This is one of those projects. We did an EIR out of an abundance of caution. It confirmed what we thought from the beginning. But it also tells you that the findings that you need to make when it comes to environmental impacts are actually very easy to make because the EIR has given you the conclusion that when it comes to any of these issue areas, these environmental issue areas, there is in fact no significant environmental effect. And that's what makes those findings that you have to make under the, under the county zoning code particularly easy to make. Let me ask a sure. question on that because I know of your long experience uh, in these matters of land use planning, Mr. Mayor Connor. Um, the allegation has been made uh, that the problem with the EIR is not necessarily with its conclusion, but that it was uh, misstating the uh, percentage increase of population. And so consequently, the public, uh, we for that matter, didn't have the opportunity to raise questions about the potential impact. How do you answer that contention? I, I answer that by, by um, going back and looking at the project description that was used to prepare the EIR. The description of the buildings to be built, of the improvements to be made, all of that is absolutely the same today as it was then, including building six new single family homes and tearing down two of them for a net increase of four, tearing down some of the dorms, putting up some newer, smaller dorms that included nine apartments for faculty members. All of those numbers, nine apartments for faculty members, four new homes for faculty members and staff, all of those numbers are the same today as they were back three years ago. The project description has not changed one iota. What has changed is the calculation, or what has been clarified, is the calculation of the number of people that will be moved onto the campus because of these changes. Now, the EIR that came out a month ago suggests that there's going to be a 30% increase in the residential population on the campus. That number, if you dive down into it, is actually exaggerated. It's actually inflated by almost 50%. And you say, well, how can that be? How is it possible that that number would be inflated by 50%? It's because the people who wrote the EIR assumed that every faculty member who's moved from a house in Carpinteria 
to a house up on Cape Mesa is going to bring along a spouse and two children. So they made the assumption that if we move 20 faculty members up onto the campus, they're going to bring along 60 family members for a total of 80. In fact, if you look at the breakdown on the K population, the, the, the workforce, the number is not three, the number is 2.2. In fact, the K population is a lot smaller, and there's a reason for that, and that is that there aren't as many kids living in those houses in, in, with those families as the EIR preparer would have assumed. So if you do the math, and we've done the math, and I actually wrote up a table that, that shows the math, it shows that there's actually not a 30% increase, it's more like a 20% increase. So you say, well, so what? It's still an increase. The so what is that the wastewater treatment plant, which is pointed to as the constraint on growth, the constraint on development, is somehow going to be overburdened. But you just heard the wastewater treatment plant was built in 2009 with this plan in mind, with this kind of campus population in mind. Ben explained that Kate has for 70 years worked to move its faculty and staff onto the campus because it believes that this is the right way to run that school. That's their pedagogical reason. And so the 2009 plan and the plant that was built in anticipation of that plan assumed that all of those people were going to move onto the campus. And when you look at the throughput numbers at the plant, in fact, the wastewater generated by the people moving onto the campus will not come anywhere near the capacity of that plant to handle the wastewater. That, in, that plant, in fact, is no constraint on the growth at all. And whether it's 20% or 30%, the conclusion is the same, and that is the small number of people moving up onto the campus is not going to create any kind of an environmental impact, any kind of a class one impact that requires mitigation. And so while there were clarifications and some corrections made in the final EIR, CEQA does not require or even authorize recirculation of an EIR when this is the kind of change that you make. You know, you, you've heard claims and arguments before from people saying, well, the EIR has been changed between the draft and the final and you have to recirculate it, which of course is a way of delaying something for six months. But CEQA actually is very clear about the circumstances under which recirculation is required. One circumstance is that if the new information shows that the project will have an environmental impact that was not disclosed in the original document. That's not, in fact, the case here because the project continues to have no significant environmental, environmental impacts. The second circumstance is if a significant environmental impact is going to be made worse because of the new information. Again, that's not the case. The project is described in the draft, the project is described in the final EIR, neither of them have significant environmental impacts. And so CEQA doesn't authorize recirculation. It doesn't do what Mr. Monk has suggested needs to be done, which is to take a perfectly good document and send it out again for public comment and revisions and responses and spend another six months spinning our wheels on a project that does not have any significant environmental impacts. Okay. I, I hope got you going. Hope, hope that's uh, clear. So it's my fault. But okay. Uh, I think we have I get a little worked up about these yeah, things. I so understand. Okay. My Thank fault. you. Is that, uh, is that it, Mr. Americaner? Did you finish your list? Really? Did you want more? No. Oh. Uh, Actually, I think I did. Let me just let me just check. I want to be sure. Did I miss anything? No. All right. I'm told to sit down. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Gerber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did want to address uh, Ms. Kearns um, saying that she didn't receive any notice of this. 
She is actually on our notice list, and Mr. Villalobos uh, checked our return envelopes, and there was nothing returned. So um, while she may not have received it, we did send it out. Okay. Um, and in general, uh, how great was the distance away from the project that people received notice? I believe it's 1,000 feet for EIRs, for projects with EIRs, 1,000 okay. foot radius of the parcels. And that would be uh, the exterior of all of the parcels, not just the center of the campus. And we agree, don't we, that that's very important that we give the neighbors notice? It's very important, yes. Okay. Um, I know, I know we all feel strongly about was that. There, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair. While I was out there, um, was there a sign, you the normal sign? Mr. I Chair, Commissioner Brown, there was. I this project underwent a BAR review as well. Okay. It's got to the point where the BAR has approved it after decision making to go for preliminary approval, and that would have been, in addition to being a discretionary hearing, okay. a very large sign, yes. Well, it's the usual yes. sign. It's not very large. It's the same. It's the, there are two the sizes, way. and oh, there? there's okay. one that's about this big that's used for discretionary projects. Okay. The question I heard was, where, where is the sign posted? At the bottom of the hill, do you know? Anyway, if you don't 